Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about leveraging education at all ages to empower underserved families and their communities. Our guests are Mia Bonta, CEO of Oakland Promise, and Meredith Curry, fellow at Northern California College Promise Coalition. So thank you so much for, for coming, Mia, Meredith. It's just wonderful to talk about education, how you approach this idea of, of using education as a way to transform the calculus that we have in this country. So let's start off with you, Mia. Um, in order to make uh, education accessible at all ages, how do you approach this problem over in Oakland? Well, in Oakland, we have this wonderful thing called the Oakland Promise, which was Oakland's promise in 2015 to create a cradle to career pipeline for children so that every child in Oakland would have the ability to be able to go to and through college and beyond. Um, it's a wonderful commitment and literally a promise that the whole city is made to every single child uh, who's furthest for, from need in particular. Cradle to career is how we do it. One of the things that I think is so important here is that we have approached education as if each segment of education or each age group is completely separate and disconnected from one another. Mm -hmm. And so what we end up having is we have problems that are built into the system so that by the time a child reaches middle school or even by the time they, they reach you know, K and Kids first grade, that's, that's exactly right. And Oakland basically is saying, no, it's an entire continuum, right? Yes. From, from, the, from the moment a child enters kindergarten, if they don't have the kinds of supports in terms of getting early childhood opportunities, even earlier with parents being able to dream and vision and put into place some of the things that they want, you know, coming out of the hospital for your child, um, you that you start to experience a, a, a gap in, in, in the kinds of opportunities that children have and that impacts a child from for their whole entire uh, educational career. And so we wanna put a stop to that. That's what well, we're Meredith, doing. How do you see the problem? Do you see it similarly as a cradle to career uh, issue? Absolutely, Mark. Um, and I have been in the college access game for almost 20 years. And so by the time I've been able to connect with students, um, the earliest has been middle school, but really the earliest that we can bring students into the different terminology that they'll need to understand, the different decision um, making opportunities that they'll have, not just around goals and careers, but affordability of some of these different options, you know, the type of lifestyle they want for themselves and their family. Um, so it's really important that we scaffold all the way through. And ideally, we're also tracking met metrics across the game so that we know how our students are, are faring in elementary, what are the challenges that are preventing them from succeeding academically, socio-emotionally, um, so that we have those potential solutions already ready for them in middle school, in high school. But yes, ideally, we wouldn't be working so much in silos. And that's a big part of what the coalition, the Northern California College Promise Coalition is about um, in terms of bringing all these different players, these different College Promise and College Access organizations together, because it is important that we really are providing holistic, comprehensive support to these students all the way through as early as we can. Well, I think Mark, uh, you raise an incredible uh, point, which is that we have really disconnected systems, right? People have developed out, we've developed out our preschool system, our K-12 system, and then our post-secondary system, and even like career readiness within that. Um, and I think Meredith is raising a really important point, which is um, uh, in places like the Bay Area in, in, in California, we also need to be connected regionally. Uh, it's where we're all living in an, uh, uh, an ecosystem that needs a higher level of connectivity, for sure. You know, that's, that's one of the things that I'd like to grapple with. I'd like to grapple with this idea, this, th th this notion of what societies, what's, what is the interest of society here? We have this debate in this country about the nanny state, about government taking care of all issues. Now, you're nonprofits, you're not government, but when we talk about how we are going to educate next generations, if the previous generations have not acquired themselves, the parents have not necessarily acquired themselves those disciplines, how do we change that 
because if we don't acquire those disciplines for our young people, then they're not gonna be prepared for work. We won't necessarily have in the economy, the employees and, and the citizens that we need. Um, how do we actually change things in a way that does not create codependence and encourages independence, but also understands that we as parents might not have the wherewithal, either financially or our own knowledge to change things. Meredith, um, how, how do you deal with that, that issue of not being codependent, but encouraging independence? Um, that's a really great question, Mark. And I think, you know, it, it starts with modeling by um, being uh, much more collaborative from the beginning in terms of understanding what are the different resources and best practices that are already available. Um, and then figuring out how to, you know, really maximize um, what we're learning on the ground by doing this work in communities with families and raising that up to all of our various partners, which does include our appointed and elected officials. Um, there is a piece of this where advocacy is important um, so that, you know, we really draw a through line between the practices that we are developing, the programs and services on the ground, but then the funding that needs to be available at the local, the state, you know, the different regional levels that would support those programs. Because with nonprofits, I mean, nonprofits tend to be funded through private philanthropic dollars. Um, and, you know, to whatever extent we can create programs that are actually sustainable for multiple years. I mean, if we wanna be able to support a student from elementary, then we have to be able to have programming that is available for multiple years. Um, we need to be able to invest in leadership and organizations that are committed to the communities um, that can work in partnership with you know, um, advocacy, um, policy, uh, as well as institutions, secondary and post-secondary. So you're making a couple of really important points. One is the analysis of where dollars can be most effectively invested. Yes. Right? So this is about a return on investment, hard-nosed analysis, because money is not infinite. The second point you're making is that we have to invest in a way that links the entire chain of education together from you know, across all ages. Uh, at Oakland Promise Mia, how do you experience that kind of, of thinking? Do you absorb intelligence in terms of how you shape your programs and then transform it? Or are you more referring to what's happening locally at Oakland? I think it's both, Mark. I think we uh, definitely integrate a lot of what we know to be best practices. In There are a couple of instances where we're actually doing work at Oakland Promise that is cutting edge and is not a part of best practice because it hasn't been very well researched. Um, for instance, kind of the return on investment that we're making for our Brilliant Baby program is uh, through financial coaching and supports um, is the idea that if you enable agency and if you enable agency through, uh, through financial coaching and preparedness, it actually changes the social determinants of like, increases the social determinants of health. So parents are less depressed. Uh, they're more optimistic about their children's future. Uh, they're more able and willing to be able to integrate themselves into the K-12 system. So we're just, we make a lot of um, very well-informed uh, research-based uh, strategies to ensure that um, every single step of the way we're connecting um, programmatically and making the kinds of investments that we think are going to pay off at the next stage along the way. Uh, and I also just, uh, you also talked about um, uh, agency, I think, uh, and the purpose of education. I think the most important uh, investment and why we make this investment is around uh, political agency and citizenship and, and that level of engagement. Um, our de entire democracy is based on ensuring that our students and our, our, our electorate is well informed and educated. And so if we're not doing that part, uh, then we are undermining our entire democracy. So there's a civil society aspect to this as well. It's not just workforce development, it's being a good American, right? Absolutely. Being an engaged American. Uh, one of the things that, that, that I think is so interesting is if we strip away, on the one hand, on the nonprofit side, right, the nonprofit speak, right? Or on the business side, the business speak. We are actually engaged, all of us are engaged in, in an analysis of how do you convert time into impact? 
right? Time into effect. If the effect you want to have is to sell another ticket to a movie or to buy another widget, then you analyze how our time and how our resources can create that effect. If our intention is to educate children, we also have a limited amount of investment capital and we want to see a maximal return. The nonprofit speak or the business speak, you know, each field has its own lingo, right? The aerospace industry has a different lingo than the software industry, than the, than the education industry, but we're all after the same kind of thing, aren't we? Absolutely. At mission-driven organizations uh, and every organization has a mission, whether it's social or not, is really investing in, in a particular outcome. And we have to be clear about that. And I think particularly as nonprofits, we do need to care about our return on investment. And as Meredith said, uh, link it to the kinds of results that we want to see within the scope of, within the scope of our mission. It's critical. Well, I want to get back to your point uh, about uh, the kinds of, of programs that you're investigating that are not yet best practices because they haven't been invest investigated. Could you just comment on, on some of the things that you're doing that are very experimental, right? Because again, we have an R&D aspect to nonprofits where you're going to try and do things that are not yet proven. And then you have to try and get investors to invest in those kinds of things. So what kind of activities were you referring to when you were talking about, um, about trying to do things that are not yet, that cannot yet be identified as a best practice because they haven't yet been proven? Right. We have a working hypothesis at Oakland Promise, two major ones. One is this continuum approach, right? Uh, it takes a long time to be able to prove um, with certainty uh, uh, that the connectivity from with a cradle to career uh, model really has the kind of impact that you need. So uh, you have to be in it for the long game and you have to have investors and stakeholders and community members um, who, are, who are with you for that time. So I think that's one um, safe bet that we're making uh, based on knowing that every indicator is connected at each stage. The other that I referenced was really um, understanding that if you make a financial investment uh, if you make an investment around kind of financial health and well-being um, for families uh, early on, it actually leads to uh, increased social determinants of health. So there's some research out there already um, indicating that that is the case, uh, not enough. And, um, and one of the critical pieces that we're focused on related to a lot of the work that Meredith is doing is around college savings accounts. So we have a hypothesis that if we get families to be able to invest themselves in college savings accounts, if we get families to um, have access to a college savings account, it actually ensures um, that they have a greater likelihood of investing in their child's education um, uh, and, and, and that a child themselves, um, knowing that they have a college savings account, is much more likely, actually three times more likely, to decide to enroll in college. So those are kind of three big bets that we're, we're trying to make sure it's approved. So it starts with the conviction. And Meredith, when you take a look at these convictions and you're trying to share information on what works and what, what doesn't work, how do you then take a conviction and working with your partners like Oakland Promise, convert that into intelligence that is actionable across the country? Well, that's, that's a fantastic question, Mark. And you know we're uh, excited, thrilled, honored, humbled to have Oakland Promise, especially as one of our members. They serve on our steering committee. And being able to sit at the table with all of these various leaders of organizations who are running their own organizations and models with their own kind of budgetary structures, et cetera, by actually modeling each other's leadership styles, each other's by sharing the different challenges that we're all facing as we're um, growing our different organizations. It was trying to pivot our models right now, um, managing all of the different um, issues that our students are facing in this new era. Um, it's actually part of um, the value of our community of practice is the community of practice, is having all these different stakeholders at the leadership levels of organizations from Stockton to Sacramento, sitting at the table, sharing what we've learned, sharing what um, we're challenged by, and coming and co-creating solutions together. So whereas Oakland Promise has hypotheses around um, you know, outcomes that are centered around the student and their family, ours are more about how we can really scale our collective, our collective impact 
and voice by sharing these different pro these it, and it's not just about practice um, and research that we're sharing. Um, sometimes it's insights, sometimes it's resources. Um, you know, as, as a coalition, we have four specific areas that we focus on, aligning public policy and working with local policymakers to make sure that we bring specifically the value propositions of programs like Oakland Promise to the light as examples of um, proof of concept, right, of some of these ideas that we'd like to see be more mainstream. Um, we also facilitate campus partnerships um, to ensure that what we're doing you know, regionally with our students, whether it's Oakland Promise or Stockton Scholars or Richmond Promise, um, makes its way as a best practice at actual campuses. So whether we're working with the Associate Vice Chancellor Don Hunt at UC Davis or the visionary President Leroy uh, Morishta at CSU East Bay, like it's really important that we bring everybody to the table. And for us to be able to see that we are actually deciding together these are the baseline metrics that we'd like to see across the board because we are all kind of managing our own data sets and tracking our own hypotheses, but being able to share it together so that we can kind of actualize some of our um, co-created uh, solutions across the region, pilot it together, test it out, adapt in real time is I think really exciting and a great opportunity that especially Oakland Promise um, helps us to avail of. So we just took a poll, it was very interesting. We asked a, a, an unfair question in that um, we were asking um, whether people felt, although we each live in our own little bubble, we were asking people to, to talk about whether there was educational opportunity equality in this country, right? So in my experience, my, my own personal experience, yeah, sure. We have, uh, you know, my parents moved to places where I could get the best education in public schools, um, in, in our extended family, if, if we had a, a particular need of, of one of our, our children in our extended families, um, you know, we were able to send them to those kind of programs and we were able to do the advocacy, the self-advocacy. So from my perspective, my own personal perspective, yeah, education is terrific. Um, now we got 85% of the people who said no education is not is not um, equal throughout the country. 15% uh, say uh, said that it was very equal, sort of like like me. Uh, what do you say? Do you think that the education system is equal for all Americans? I'm asking I'm asking a question with, uh, to which I know the answer because I mean in part you're here, but let's no, let's really take this seriously because everybody has their own experience. Uh, so. How do, you, how do you bridge that gap in terms of, first of all, um, creating a recognition that different people in the United States see this problem differently, and also that we as Americans should help people who are less fortunate um, to, to bridge that so that they have the same opportunity as our children? Um, Mia, how do, you, how do you deal with that, with that issue? Because if we can't collectively come to some agreement and do something together, we're, we're going to be sniping at each other for a long time in this country. I think uh, if we come to agreement on one basic uh, notion, which is that our educational systems were not actually built for people that look like me and Meredith. Um, and uh, and they were actually built with, the, with a completely different in, intention um, to be able to ensure that people uh, who were uh, in agriculture had some basic some basic knowledge and uh, and uh, and and we're living in the 21st century so I like to think that we have an ability to bridge if we kind of think about what needs to be done right now in our country in this in the 21st century um, I like to focus our energy on ensuring that we're focused on acknowledging where we do have division and where we do have inequity and uh, and that we're taking advantage of the fact that we're, you know, right now for the first time in a long time, open to asking ourselves the questions about how we are in an inequitable systems and what we need to do um, as a individuals, as a community, and as a society to really to bridge those gaps uh, and do so unabashedly. I, we 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 should. I think the the more power that we can bring to people. Uh, acknowledging where there is need 
and how we should be addressing that, I think uh, we're all going to be better off. Back to my earlier notion of the true uh, impact of education is when we ensure that our citizenry is um, well informed and well engaged. So if I'm in San Francisco, a prosperous uh, city, if I'm in Houston, a prosperous city, if I'm in uh, Chicago, if I'm in, um, in Washington, uh, uh, Seattle, um, why do I care about a child in Stockton? That's a fantastic question. I mean, the student that lives in Stockton is gonna have similar experiences and challenges, even though there might be some other varieties of differences than someone who is low income, underserved, disenfranchised in another urban city. And I think what we need to think about is when we think of accessibility, are we considering not just the region of our students, but really how our students identify? And just, you know, expanding a little bit on Mia mentioning, noting that, you know, the system wasn't really created for us, you know, are, if the students are identifying as male, female, non-gender conforming, the metrics are different for them. If, um, and if we're tracking the data based on um, uh, cultural identity, sometimes we're not disaggregating the data enough to understand how our Filipino or Cambodian students might be affected differently than our, you know, Japanese or Indian students. And so as a parent, you know, you're not just a parent of a student, you're a parent of a student that has multiple identities and influences that are gonna impact their opportunities. And at every step of the way, those opportunities are gonna be impacted based on the um, absence or access um, that that student has. And what we decide on as um, a community about what access really should look like, about what equity really means, I mean, one of the biggest things we're seeing right now is that the, di the digital divide is so much wider than we could have ever expected, than we had anticipated. And we're realizing that even our definition of education didn't necessarily include this um, assumption that students should even have the tools that they need to be able to access it. So I think, you know, a student um, in a, a city on the East Coast versus a student on the West Coast are going to have the same challenges as they figure out how to serve, how to um, serve and solve some of these greater challenges we're experiencing as a country. Um, but also the student in, you know, New Hampshire and the student in Sacramento who both decide to go to the same college are going to be impacted by the same challenges when they get to the same region. So I think um, we just have to, um, as much as possible, think of our interconnectivity to each other. Um, going back to Mia's point about democracy and, um, you know, just thinking of the bigger picture of how we serve each other. Um, we want to serve our students as well by making sure that they're thinking more broadly also about our bigger our bigger nation. And, and, and I think that no matter how you slice it, um, it is better for the country to have more educated people, right? We, we, we compete better in terms of uh, economic, our economic strength. We defend better in terms of our military if we are educated. We are better citizens. Um, and and Meredith, your your example of of uh, kids coming together in a in a college uh, setting, coming from different places. If we have the same base, we can actually do stuff. We can actually be productive instead of start starting off with remediation. And that's true for a workplace. That's true for the military. It's true in every single walk of life, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, you know, you could be in New Hampshire, I could be in Texas, and Meredith could be in California right now, given the digital age uh, and the information age that we're living in right now. Um, those uh, regional lines, uh, even those state lines are like, if we look forward, they, they, they are already um, quite, um, quite integrated right now. And so I think we put a lot of um, parameters on ourselves that actually are not indicative of what the future holds for us in, in education. Um, and, uh, and I want to be somebody in California that cares about a student in Texas because that uh, Texas student could be my future employee, that Texas student could be my future citizen in the city. So uh, that interconnectedness is really um, uh, with technology as it stands right now and the connectivity that uh, virtual spaces, as we're all reminded of, particularly in this moment, create for us, uh, just eliminate um, our ability to be siloed even in, a, in, our, in our statehood, in our thinking. 
I think it's also an extension of America's idea of, of uh, competition and that people can move across geographies and particularly enabled by uh, products like Zoom, uh, where we could be literally sitting anywhere. We could have our, all of our fake backdrops, but it really doesn't matter where we are as long as we have a good internet connection. So that whole idea of the digital divide, which was mentioned earlier in the program, the whole idea of being able to move wherever you want to move and still be able to contribute. So now we're talking about um, educational equity. So to enable the America that is that sort of vital competitive uh, nation where people can pursue life, liberty, and happiness uh, uh, to, to, to their own uh, will. We just completed uh, uh, one uh, poll and another one is in, pro in process. Um, the previous poll uh, basically had two thirds of respondents saying that uh, America, the American education system needs fundamental change with many of the, ba with the balance saying that we need constant change. So let's not worry about whether it's fundamental or constant. Uh, let's talk about the change that is needed. So if you were to choose one thing, and I'm just, just saying one thing, I'm gonna limit you. If you were to choose one thing, what would you choose? I would uh, right now in this moment in time, choose to ensure that every child in our educational system has access to the digital tools that they need. Uh, and that's curriculum, technology, technical assistance, connectivity, I'm cheating. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, that, that every child ha has the ability to connect to their educational uh, media at this digital. moment. You're, you, if you could fix one thing, it's the digital divide. Right now, absolutely, yes. It, it is going to be the thing that governs our uh, governs our ability to be able to engage. Uh, we have families who don't have the ability to access basic resources because they don't have the kind of connectivity that they need. We have students who, uh, preschoolers who don't have a, a tablet in their hands, which means that they in this world um, have in their home fewer than 10 books uh, versus the 10,000 that they could have if they were just able to access uh, uh, digital resources. It, it's, it's exponential. It's an exponential challenge that we've layered into our educational system with that, with that. This is our digital model. Disconnect. And if I could just piggyback on me as no around digital divide. Um, I mean, in addition to the lack of resources, I mean, we're, we're looking at a combination of chronic absences, um, the no connectivity to individuals or peers, you know, um, lack of relationships, loss of control or access to key supporters. So um, all of this ends up leading to challenges for students in terms of making up their, their progress over the next several years. So I would, I would totally agree with Mia that the digital divide is the first, but since she's taken it, I would say that as a second would be focusing more um, also on how we bring career pathways to our students. Um, as one of those you know, resources or tools that are accessible through those digital um, resources, just because we really need to expand students' options, thinkings, opportunities um, in terms of how they'll be able to, uh, you know, create economic opportunities for themselves during and past COVID. So we just completed another poll, and we're coming to the end of uh, end of the show. So I'm going to give each of you first Mia, and then Meredith. Um, and Meredith will have the last word uh, here. Uh, but the poll that we just took is quite interesting. We asked whether the pandemic is changing education. And 57% of respondents uh, said there is change, but it's too early to tell whether things are getting better or worse. 36% mm -hmm. um, uh, said that educational access is actually getting worse through this pandemic. Um, Mia, um, how do you see us maneuvering through the next couple of years? And how do you see us having to respond in a way that it is better? that the pandemic, which has affected us and has killed so many Americans, has killed so many people around the world, is really disrupting our economy, that we derive some benefit by the way we adjust to it in our Absolutely. educational system. How do we deal with that? Uh, I think the pandemic has uh, really exposed a lot of inequities in our educational system. And so 
uh, the way that we deal with that is uh, recognizing that we need to do some very quick transformative work uh, in addressing those inequities uh, through focusing on the digital divide, through focusing on closing those silos through, as Oakland Promise has adopted a cradle to career continuum, through making the kinds of investments that we need to in our students early uh, and throughout their educational process and build that connectivity. Uh, and we need to do it in a medium that is accessible to our, to our students. We need to just recognize that unfortunately, um, what we're dealing with right now is likely what we're going to be dealing with some version of it um, for the next several years. Uh, and quite frankly, the nonprofit sector as, as, as the solver of many of the systemic uh, uh, issues related to education and, and, and others are, are really where I think we as a country need to attend and make some investments. We have a lot of community-based organizations uh, at Oakland Promise that we partner with. Um, we ourselves are a nonprofit. Uh, uh, government relies on our ingenuity, on our catalytic uh, nature, on our ability to create proof points um, to be able to create more systemic change. So um, I think we deal with it by investing in, in, in the nonprofit sector that you so uh, ably champion, Mark. Meredith, I'll give you the last word. Thanks so much, Mark. And a huge thanks to you, Mia. Um, just to piggyback on that, I, I mean, the uh, as I mentioned with the coalition, we have over 15 different members. And so, you know, I would put a call to action to also do this work in collaboration um, to find ways to uh, work together to share and um, scale resources. Um, uh, there's something my cousin taught me this year, fail fast. That is something we're all gonna need to do. Um, and I think especially the leaders of key organizations, um, you know, coming together figuring out what are the ways we can quickly adapt while still creating plans and momentum for long-term change is gonna be critical. I'd like to thank you both. What we in America have to do, and I think you both have pointed it out, is we need to adapt. We need to do what, what we've always done through our history. We need to thrive in adversity and above all, we need to see the children of other people as important to the future of this country as we see our own. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for attending attendees. It's been wonderful to chat about this. That's the nonprofit report. Everybody stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next Tuesday.